Welcome back to Perth City Talks, where we are at Perth Concert Hall for the debate, Does Science and God Mix? I guess one of the things that, that strikes me is that in your story about boiling water and tea, you actually said, I think, that you need both explanations. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's one of the clear understandings here, that you actually need both explanations, that maybe they're different realms of inquiry and discourse, and trying to reconcile them is to try and reconcile the irreconcilable. So maybe you could expand a little on that idea of two levels of explanation and discourse. Do we have to try and bang their heads together? No, I don't think we do, you mm. see. And I don't think the early pioneers of science did because they had a fairly clear idea that, in a sense, Kepler put it, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. It wouldn't have occurred to him that studying the motions of the planets was somehow competing with God as an explanation. Because God is the bigger level of explanation. He's the explanation of why there's something rather than nothing, of why there's a universe at all for science to study. But we've got ourselves into a bind, I really do believe, by twisting the concept of God back to the Greek ideas, and then using that as an Aunt Sally to dismiss that the God of the gaps, science can dismiss the God of the gaps. Well, of course, if you define God that way, science will dismiss that God, and good riddance, in my view. I don't think Hume was right when he said miracles are violations of the laws of nature. And it's here that C.S. Lewis has got this beautiful illustration. So I, I'm staying in a very pleasant place here in Perth. So I put $100 in my drawer last night, and I put $100 tonight, so that's $200. And tomorrow morning, I find $50. So what do I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of Australia? Or well, the laws of your own mind, perhaps. Well, okay, well, let's leave the laws of my own mind or, or my wife's taken it to go shopping. I know that's all possible. But the interesting thing is we laugh because we immediately see that the uses of the word law are different in both cases. And that's the problem. We are used to law, the law of the state, and violation because we're thinking of law as something with the police behind it and all this kind of thing. But what are the laws of science? They're simply our descriptions of what normally happens. God has ordered a regular universe with things that normally happen. Now, the irony is, Hume said, of course, in the time of the New Testament, people were primitive, pre-scientific, and so they could see miracles everywhere. He's simply wrong. Because the only way they recognized the resurrection of Jesus as being a miracle was because they knew that dead bodies don't just spring up all over the place. It seems to me that one of the problems in a lot of this debate is the desire for absolute certainty at a time, uh, especially in the study of human behavior and consciousness, where our knowledge is very partial and slight. We know more about the cosmos than we do about our, uh, ourselves. Mm. The, the way we develop, the way we think, and thinking about thinking is really pretty early in scientific terms. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, whether you come well, across that I, absolutism. I can, I can comment on it because <laughs> I come from a race of people that love absolutism. <laughs> and, and what I would say is this, that I take your point, and uh, I, the consciousness debate is utterly fascinating. I think if I were younger, I'd like, I probably have the ability to be a neuroscientist because I think that's where the big questions are going to come. And I've thought a little bit about it, and actually written a bit about it, but the point to my mind is, 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 is this, that it's absolutely true that certain people crave certainty. Now, a craving for certainty, of course, as a psychological phenomenon, does not of itself mean that certainty cannot be had. And I know no other way of dealing with this kind of thing, but on the basis of evidence. Let me, let me transmute the thing or transpose it into a different key. Am I certain that my wife loves me? Now, I'm sure you could advance all kinds of psychological questions and so on. And I would say, with my mathematical head, no, you can't be absolutely certain. But you can have confidence beyond reasonable doubt that you'd uh, stake your life on it. 
Um, okay, thank you very much, John. Um, I now have an, an iPad here, which I think I can read, with your questions on it. And the first of them actually comes directly, really, from what you've just been saying, John, but I think I'll ask it anyway, because it's a slightly different emphasis. So how do you think your upbringing in Northern Ireland influenced your worldview and your perception of the intertwining of science and religion? It so. influenced it a great deal. My, my parents had a very modest education, but they were very remarkable. And this touches on your subject of research. In a very sectarian country, they were Christian without being sectarian. Now, what do I mean by that? They employed Protestants and Catholics equally in their business and were bombed for it. My father believed that all human beings were made in the image of God and therefore of infinite value, and therefore you must not discriminate on the basis of religion. Now, that was a courageous stand. So I didn't grow up with the sectarian baggage that so many of my contemporaries grew up with. Next question, uh, what do you think of the new multiverse idea to explain that our universe is just one of many and a Goldilocks one with the right physical and, and laws to permit life? Well, I find it a fascinating idea. I sometimes wonder, but this will express a terrible bias if it's not um, um, a, a desperate way of dealing with the question. <laughs> Again, it sets up a false alternative. Max Tegmark, the man in Princeton who was responsible for generating this idea that there's an infinite number of universes in which anything that can happen will happen. So it's not surprising you're in this one because after all, it's the only kind of one you could find yourself in. Those arguments don't work very well, I think. Firstly, Max Tegmark says there's either a multiverse or there's a creator. Now, the problem is created by the extreme fine-tuning of our universe. It is so special. And we have discovered that over the past 50 years. Amazingly special. Roger Penrose, one of my colleagues at, at Oxford, who's not a theist at all, but he, he puts it in theistic language. He said, you know, to have a universe like this in which there's a second law of thermodynamics, the creator's aim, and I'm quoting him, has to be accurate to one part in 10 to the power 10 to the power 123, which is a number so big that if you put a one here and a zero in every elementary particle in the universe, you can't even write it out to the base 10. So it's incredible how precise our universe has to be in order to have life on it. So that has been part, not the only cause, but part of the reason that the, the multiverse has been generated in because people have thought that by increasing the number of universes, you somehow increase the, the probability of having a universe li like this one to a likelihood. Wonderful question here from a 14-year-old um, who says, I'm 14 and I feel as though God does not speak to me. Why doesn't he? What a fascinating mm. question. Well, I admire a 14-year-old who comes up in the crowd like this with a question. You feel that God doesn't speak to you. Now, that's a very personal question. How does God speak to us? Some people imagine that, that God speaks to us by you hear a voice and all this kind of thing. If I'm asked the question about God speaking, the way I would answer it is this. Where I sense, and of course, this is highly subjective, and I'm aware of it, but you've asked me the question. One of the things that really convinces me that Christianity is true is when I reflectively and meditatively read Scripture, take the Bible seriously. There are times, doesn't happen all the time. The whole idea that um, in belief, sometimes comes excuse. That for some people, a belief in God, as you've just been describing, enables them in a sense to externalize the responsibility that they have to live a good and wholesome life. That they look outside themselves for an understanding of how to live and how to be. Are you essentially referring to the Freudian argument there? It could be. Yes, well, my... But not only, he's not the only one who's written in those terms. No, he's not, of course, but... And, and it, a lot of very good writers That's the idea, well. the, the, the externalization, a father figure, mm. you need something to, yes. 
to that, that to kind assuage of idea. your fear of death. Yes, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Okay, I'm on the same page as, as you are. Well, I, I uh, consulted a psychiatrist on this. <laughs> <laughs> because it's very interesting, because it's one of the thrusts that is in Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. That's a psychiatric term, you see, and he's referring to the Freudian argument. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at what some leading psychiatrists say about it. And the past president of the Royal College in, in London, Andrew Sims, has written a very interesting book, Is Faith a Delusion? But I think the most interesting thing I got from Manfred Lutz, who's a leading psychiatrist in Germany, you've probably come across him, and he writes this very interesting book where he says, look, if there is no God, Freud's argument's brilliant, of saying, yes, religion is a wish fulfillment, a projection of a father figure in the sky and a desire for a crutch and so on, if there is no God. Of course, he said, if there is a God, Freud's argument equally well shows how atheism is a wish fulfillment. <laughs> the desire never to have to meet God. Now I'm quoting from Czesław Miłosz, who was the Nobel Prize winner for literature in Poland. And he said, atheism is the great opiate of the people, the wish fulfillment that we never have to give an account. And then Manfred Lutz draws his bottom line. He said, on the question whether there's a God or not, neither Freud, Jung, nor Frankel can help you. And just a little codicil to that. Stephen Hawking was asked some time ago uh, what he thought of religion. And he said, religion's a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And I was asked to comment, so I did. Atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> great admirer of uh, John Lennox and I love him dearly. So I think it went well. And what was, was there any, what was the most poignant moment for you in, in the question and answer? That um, I think he answered all the questions that the people um, asked him and he is brilliant. My wife is actually the one that's into it and she dragged me along and I find it very interesting. And yeah, it's something to think about. Yeah, absolutely, food for thought. Was there any one particular point that really resonated with you this evening? Um, yeah, that the fact that science and Christianity uh, doesn't add up to everything, but as you put it, not everything can be explained, but if you believe in God, then it makes more sense. And did it live up to your expectations? Yeah, in the sense, as I understood it, it wasn't going to be a debate, but a uh, uh, you know a conversation. It definitely was that, and it had you know there was kind of time to tease out things and stuff. So yeah, very much lived up to my expectations. Are there are there any questions about your religion that would make you doubt? Yeah, I, I yeah. So you know, I am religious and I do doubt, and I think I think things like that that one, the problem of evil and suffering, is a is a really pressing one. And, uh, and how that, uh, you know, why God doesn't intervene in certain situations and so on. I think I find that quite, uh, I guess, intellectually difficult and personally, like, challenges, to, you know, I think existentially challenging as well. I took a lot of notes. There was a lot of information, but, um, yeah, it was easy to digest, I think. And I like the way that they split it up where, like, he spoke at the start and then the second half, like, you could ask questions and, like, you could have your own input. Because yeah. um, it's always really interesting to see what other people are thinking and what other people in the audience have to say. And he responded so fast to all of them. Like, he always knew what his answer was going to be. And, yeah, I just thought it was a really interesting night. Can you tell me what you gained um, from the debate this evening? I think it's something we've been discussing a lot at school at the moment as a philosophy student, something that's definitely also as a Christian been something that I've been discussing with myself so it's been good to sort of get some uh, it's sort of like a level of clarification another way of thinking things and answers to questions I've had and my peers have had that in ways I've never thought of and ways to answer it that are based more on logic than on Jesus which is always a more helpful way to discuss with non-Christians which I really benefited from. good to have that element of spontaneity and there were good questions I thought, very good questions. And have you enjoyed Australia? Oh enormously, oh yes, yes. Will we see you again? You might well do.
<laughs> be wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night.